Welcome to the 11th episode of A Visual Approach to Optics, A Guide for Clinicians, narrated by Dr. John Gorfinkel. In the last episode, we completed 249 out of 278 slides. We finished with this slide on bicentric lens. Here we discuss the stenopaic slit. The stenopaic slit is a horizontal opening or aperture which is much longer than it is wide. It is a form of pinholing in one axis only. In this case, the horizontal stenopaic slit is effectively a pinhole in the vertical axis. In other words, if we shine a line on to the surface at right angles, only a small portion would go through. Here we show an object point being refracted by a cylindrical lens, in which case the object point ends up as an image line. The image line then reaches the stenopaic slit, and instead of showing up as a line on the screen behind the aperture, it only shows a point because only one small section of this vertical line makes it through the horizontal stenopaic slit. In this way, we have described a pinhole effect of this vertical line. In other words, we have reduced what would have been a blur line into an image point. We can use this principle to refract a patient. Although we don't often use stenopaic slit refraction uh, clinically, it is instructive to understand optics. The theoretical advantage of this would be that refraction is still possible if there is a poor red reflex and regular retinoscopy is impossible. So let's go through the steps. Here we have a conoid of sturm in front of the retina with the horizontal line closer to the retina than the vertical. The stenopaic slit is rotated to give the clearest vision. This will occur when it is at right angles to the horizontal line closer to the retina. We will then change the sphere of lens correction in front of the patient to give the clearest vision, which will occur when this horizontal line that is pinholed is moved on to the retina. We then rotate the stenopaic slit 90 degrees to the original position, which will pinhole the vertical line in this diagram. We then add sphere as necessary to further clear up the vision, which will occur when this vertical line is placed on the retina. In this two-step procedure, we have measured the patient's refraction. The first power used with the stenopaic slit in the first position will be the sphere. The second power used with the stenopaic slit in the second position will be the cylinder. The basic principle here is to understand that we are pinholing the lines of the conoid in sequence and moving those pinholed lines onto the retina and by doing so we have measured the refraction. One can also refract the patient using the astigmatic dial. We have a diagram here with lines at various axes. Basically, we fog the patient, which means move the image in front of the retina by adding plus or subtracting minus lens correction in front of the patient. We then place more minus lens to push the image slowly backwards until one meridian is sharp. That number will be the spherical power. We then put more minus cylinder at 90 degrees away from that original meridian until all the lines are sharp and that will give the cylindrical power. Here we go into a little more detail about bifocal glasses. Here we have a flat top bifocal lens. What this means is that the segment at the top is flat 
and not round, and the optical center is generally near the margin of the reading segment. And this is a different optical center than the one of the distance lens, the base lens in the pair of glasses. As one moves one's gaze from the distance to the reading position, the eye is moving downward and the position is crossing the upper margin of the segment. As it is doing so, there is no image jump at the top of the flat segment because there is no prismatic power of this segment at that place. But there is more image displacement at the final reading position. Here we show two plus lenses, the distance and the near lens, both with base up prism that add to each other. However, if both eyes are the same, this shouldn't be too much of a problem unless the number is very high. Here we see as one moves one's eyes to the reading position, one crosses the upper boundary of this round top bifocal. The optical center of the reading segment is over here, so that the reading segment does have prismatic power at the upper margin. As the eye crosses that boundary, one will experience image jump. However, here we see less image displacement. Here we show what happens with a flat top bifocal where the distance lens is a minus lens. Note that in the reading position, there is prismatic power base down from the distance lens, but base up for the near lens. There is less image displacement overall, and because there is no image jump at the flat top boundary, one gets the best of both worlds, less image displacement and no image jump. One can see that with minus distance lenses, one would never want a round top bifocal because that would create both image jump and more image displacement at the reading position. Chromatic aberration occurs because different wavelengths of light undergo different amounts of refraction. In other words, the index of refraction of a medium is different for different wavelengths. We generally describe the index of refraction as that for yellow light. Blue light will undergo more refraction, as shown here, than, say, red light here. In this case, we show the yellow light is focused on the retina in this particular patient. The blue light and the red light, however, will not be focused in the same plane, and this results in chromatic aberration. In other words, an image point at infinity is not focused to a sharp image point on the retina, but to a series of points and blur circles depending on the wavelength. Monochromatic aberrations occur even if there is only one wavelength of light. So in this case, we show that an object at infinity without aberration is focused to a point on the retina. However, with spherical aberration, the peripheral part of the image undergoes more refraction than the central part, and we see that there is no one place where all the light is focused. There is a series of points and blur circles. If we represent the retina as being here, at the primary focal point of the optical system of the eye, which we represent by a lens here, then the diverging light coming from this point on the retina should be conjugate with infinity. In other words, a planar wave should emanate from that optical system. Another way of saying planar wave is parallel rays of light. With spherical aberration, we see that the peripheral parts of the wave undergo more refraction than the central parts. We have a conical wave front which is more curved in the periphery than in the center. Another way of saying that is that the more peripheral rays 
are bent slightly inward as compared to the central ones. The difference between the ideal planar wave that comes out and the actual conical wave is called the wavefront aberration. One can measure the root mean square error throughout this distance to get a measure of the spherical aberration. Here we show another diagram in which an object is in front of a lens that would form a sharp image point here if there were no spherical aberration. The ideal spherical wavefront leaving this lens would be concentric with a center of the radius of curvature somewhere here. But because the peripheral rays undergo more refraction than the central ones, in other words, more conical wavefronts or more bent-in peripheral rays is another way of looking at it, one gets a series of points in an area that creates a blur circle on the image plane. In the previous diagram, we, we chose to place the object point at the primary focal point of the lens so that the image would be at infinity. In this diagram, we chose to have a diagram in which an object point is conjugate with an image plane here. In order to reduce spherical aberration where peripheral rays undergo more refraction, we can just increase the power of the central part of the lens by increasing its curvature. This curve here is a prolate surface and is no longer spherical. We call this an aspheric lens. A prolate surface is more conical than a spherical surface. A spherical surface has a Q value of zero. A prolate surface will have a Q value less than zero, and an oblate surface will have one more than zero. It turns out that if we have enough of a prolate surface, such that the Q value is minus 0.5, we will have no spherical aberration. Note that although the average cornea has a prolate surface, it has a prolate surface of minus a quarter, which is not quite enough, as in minus a half, to eliminate spherical aberration. So most corneas have some residual spherical aberration, typically in the range of plus 0 0.27 micron which is the root mean square described on the previous slide. Try not to confuse the Q value of minus 0.26, which describes how prolate the surface is, with the spherical aberration that results, which is plus 0.27 micron. Note that the 20 diopter handheld lens that you use for indirect ophthalmoscopy is in a spheric lens which has a prolate surface that is more curved in the center than a spherical surface would be, and therefore corrects for spherical aberration. Another aberration is coma, in which off-axis points of light are focused into a comma-shaped blob of light on the image plane. One could say that it is sort of a combination of astigmatism of oblique incidence and spherical aberration. Here we see other monochromatic aberrations, curvature of field, and astigmatism of oblique incidence. Because oblique rays undergo more refraction than paraxial rays, the image is brought closer to the lens here than it is here. In addition, the off-axis points undergo astigmatic refraction and create little conoids of sturm, as shown here. So there are both little conoids and also curvature of field occurring at the same time. Here we show only the curvature of field that occurs in a lens. In other words, the image would be most clear on a surface that is somewhat curved than on a flat screen. This curved surface, or Petzval surface, is the 
shape of the retina. So it is apparent that the retina is well designed uh, to get the clearest uh, image of both peripheral and central points. Another aberration is distortion caused by varying magnification of central versus peripheral field. In pincushion distortion, the peripheral field is magnified to a greater extent than the central. In barrel distortion, the peripheral is magnified to a lesser extent than the central. This is not a straightforward distortion and is difficult to explain within the scope of this course. Suffice to say that not only the converging or diverging nature of the lens, but also the position of the aperture, whether in front of or behind the lens, in the lens system, will affect the result. Let's summarize by saying that the plus lens of the eye is behind the aperture or pupil and creates barrel distortion, whereas the plus lens of a spectacle lens in front of the aperture or pupil of the eye results in pincushion distortion. When discussing aberrations of the eye, we by convention say that the light emanating from the retina is exiting upwards through the pupil. In this diagram, we show the retina conjugate with infinity and parallel rays or planar wave fronts are leaving the eye in this emetropic eye. Here we see what happens in the myopic eye. The retina is not conjugate with infinity, but with a point in front of the eye. In other words, the light leaving the eye is convergent. The wave fronts are convergent, or one could say the rays are convergent and form an image point at a finite distance away. This is the 2D image in which we show the most forward parts of the wave in red and the lagging parts in blue. In the 3D diagram here, we show a, a wave front of light where the leading parts are shown in the uh, warmer colors and the lagging parts. This is a converging wavefront, analogous to the 2D version. Not all wavefront aberrometers use this color scheme by convention. Some actually reverse the colors versus position, as shown here. In the hyperopic eye, the retina is conjugate with a point beyond infinity. The rays leaving are divergent. One sees a concave expanding wavefront in 2D and in 3D. Here we see what the wavefront looks like in three dimensions when the eye has mixed astigmatism. In one axis, the wavefront is concave, and in the other axis, it is convex it looks like a potato chip. In other words, in this eye, the eye is uh, myopic in one axis, but hyperopic in the other. Before we saw the lower order aberrations, now we are looking at the higher order aberrations. In this uh, diagram, we see spherical aberration here, in which the periphery undergoes more refraction and moves ahead of the central part uh, of the wavefront. There is also a small central area that moves ahead of the mid peripheral. Coma results when one side of the wavefront has a different vergence than the other side. One could say that one side of the wavefront is running ahead of the other side. This was the comma shaped blob that was described in an earlier slide. Here is an example of trefoil, where three areas of the wavefront are running ahead of the others. One way to measure aberrations is to use the hartmann shack aberrometer. Here we show planar wavefronts coming from the left, reaching an array of lenses that focuses the light into a regular array on a sensor. With irregular wavefronts, the array of lenses will focus the light in a rather less uniform manner. 
and this non-uniformity can be measured. The quality of an optical system can be measured using something known as the modulation transfer function. Basically, we have an object which is very sharp. We see the intensity across this line here going from 0 to 100% contrast. After going through an optical system with various aberrations and imperfections, we see an image that looks like this. The intensity profile is now somewhat different, and the contrast ratio from maximum to minimum is now 85% in this particular diagram as compared to the object 100%. We could say that the contrast of these spatial frequencies in the image is 85% as good as that of the object. We now have a higher spatial frequency set of light and dark going through this lens system and we show the contrast ratio of the image here at 50% of that of the object. In other words, the contrast of the higher spatial frequencies here is only 50%, whereas of the lower spatial frequencies it's 85%. In this particular scheme, we show an optical system that gives a better image of the lower spatial frequency parts of the image than of the higher. If I equals the intensity, then the modulation is equal to the difference from the minimum to the maximum intensity divided by the sum of the minimum and maximum intensity. We then take the modulation of the image and divide by the modulation of the object and that gives us the modulation transfer function. This is a fraction. The closer to one, the better. In other words, we want the modulation of the image to be as close to that of the object as possible. Here we see the modulation transfer function of the young adult human eye. We see that the contrast ratio is better for lower spatial frequencies than for higher spatial frequencies and we can plot a curve. The higher this curve is across all spatial frequencies, say here or, or here, the better will be the overall modulation transfer function. Because the fovea of the eye is displaced in the temporal uh, direction from the geometrical axis of the eye, the eye needs to turn to line up the fovea with the object of interest. This line is the visual axis shown in green. The geometrical or optical axis of the eye is shown in blue. The angle between them is angle alpha. These lines cross at the nodal point. The nodal point here is the center of rotation of the eye. This is different than the nodal point in previous discussions in Virgin's diagrams. In other words, nodal point has two different meanings. In practice, it is easier to measure the angle kappa, which is between the visual axis and the pupillary axis of the eye, than it is to measure angle alpha. Angle kappa is sufficient for most clinical purposes. Angle kappa, uh, if it is positive, makes the eyes look exotropic because the center of the pupil appears to be temporal to the light reflecting off the cornea at the visual axis. In patients with a negative angle kappa, the eyes appear to be esotropic. One way to tell the difference between exotropia and positive angle kappa is that in exotropia one eye must be aligned with the light being shined, whereas in angle kappa neither eye is aligned 
with the light. Because of the phenomenon of an angle kappa or angle alpha, in other words, because the visual axis is not aligned with the optical axis, we can get unusual stereoptic effects of different colors of light. In this diagram, we show how if the red light is focused behind the retina and the blue light is focused in front of the retina and then rays cross until they reach the retina, one can get an overall weighting of the light blob on the retina in a temporal direction for red light and in a nasal direction for blue. By temporal disparity is perceived as closer whereas by nasal disparity of the two eyes is perceived as farther away. Those persons with positive angle uh, alpha or kappa will have uh, a sensation of red light being closer than blue. Those with a negative angle kappa will have the reverse. It is not always easy to predict how much of this effect a patient will have because the centration of the pupil also varies in individuals. This diagram is intended for those who are interested. Nowadays we have lens implants which are multifocal that create multiple foci at once so that some of the lens is able to focus less virgin light from a distance and more virgin light from near. Some of the light is focused one way and some is the other way and this allows for the multifocality of the lens. Light is scattered and diffracted around the edges of discontinuities. Although this looks like a Fresnel lens, it isn't quite the same thing, but the spacing of these grooves is adjusted in just the right manner to create a net effect of constructive and destructive interference of light waves to create multiple foci of light simultaneously. This diffractive etching can be placed on a base curve of a lens that corrects for distance vision so that the additional diffractive component will allow for middle or and or near vision. Here we see the side view of this hybrid lens, the refractive component here adjusted for distance and the diffractive component here for near vision. Here we show schematically how we have a refractive lens. We put a diffractive etching on the surface and we have a hybrid lens to give the multiple foci. Suffice to say that light is split, some of it remains for distance vision and some of it gets scattered and combines to form images for near objects. One schematic would have 40% for distance, 40% for near, and then 20% is lost. There are different variations for different designs, but in summary there is some loss of light and this does degrade the visual acuity to a certain degree. There is also the problem that some light is always in focus and some causing blur circles. And this can be seen as halo or glare to varying degrees by different patients in different lighting situations. In other words, it is not a perfect system. However, the designs are improving over time. This concludes the 11 lectures of approximately one half hour each on optics. This course was intended for clinicians who are studying to become ophthalmologists or optometrists. The aim of the course was to concentrate on the quality of the diagrams so as to make the material clearer and more understandable. It is a visual science more than anything. Thank you. This course was designed by Drs. John Gorfinkel, Sharif Eldefrawi, and John Lloyd of the Department of Ophthalmology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto, in Toronto, Canada.